Is that, that's everybody back who's coming back, pretty much? All right, we have a few more people coming in. So thanks very much for sticking around. I'm aware we've we ran a little bit over time. Not going to point any fingers at my Russian friend. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I think we all know why. Um, but it's great. Thanks all very much for coming back. We'll get through this very fast. Uh, this is a really the most fun part, and there's also loads of great talks to come as well. Before we jump into those, we're going to do the final Kahoot. So I said to you all earlier that uh, I was racking myself uh, over the, the PR bombs, wondering, like, there's a line. And on one side of us, you're seen to be edgy. And on the other side, you're just seen to be a headbanger. Um, and I was saying that the only people whose opinion really matters is, is yours. So we're going to do another Kahoot now. If we can bring the Kahoot up on the screen. Um, yeah, so the, the survey is this, 665393. And please answer this honestly. Um, I'm thinking more about for future rather than what went on in the past. So the question is going to be around about your, op your opinion um, on good PR and bad PR. So here we go. Everyone's logging in. We're not getting the warning for rude names this time, which is interesting. <laughs> All right. So for you, never mind anyone else, for you, were uh, the PR bombs good publicity or bad publicity? And I really want your honest answer. God. <laughs> Three, two, do 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 boom. Okay. Oh! All right. You've just given me a very dangerous permission. <laughs> OK, brilliant. All right, jeez, I feel lighter. Um, OK, so we're going to move into our quick fire talks now. Um, I'm not going to get up and introduce in between. Uh, talk is going to get up, say their thing, get down. Next speaker is going to get up. So up first, uh, Luke is going to talk about the SEO spider trap. Take it away, Luke. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, folks. My name is Luke. I'm here to talk about the perils. <laughs> the perils of having a spider trap on your website. Just a quick forewarning, some of this is pretty nerdy, technical, heavy stuff, but um, we do feel it's quite important because if a spider can't crawl your website, it can't index it, it can't rank it, and it can't generate organic revenue for your website. It's also important because nine of the 51 clients we've audited here in the Wolfgang SEO team in the past year have been negatively affected by spider traps. That's one in six of our lovely SEO clients here today. So the, the aim of the game with SEO is essentially to make Googlebot love your website. In order to do that, you must first understand the, the very fundamental concept of crawl budget. Crawl budget is loosely defined as the amount of time or number of pages Google allocates to crawl a website. To get an estimate of your own, your own crawl budget, you can jump into um, crawl stats within Google Search Console, find your daily average, multiply by 30, and you've got a, an estimated monthly crawl budget. If the number of URLs that you want to rank for in the Google SERPs is far higher than this particular number, then chances are you've got a serious crawl issue, such as a spider trap on your website. There's four main types of spider traps that we've encountered here over the past year. I'll now run through each of them with a quick example. The first and possibly the most easy to, to lo locate and diagnose on your website is the calendar trap. If, for example, you have a, a calendar on your website and you're able to navigate, say, a thousand years from today's date into the future, chances are you have a calendar trap on your website. As time is, by very definition, infinite, then any URLs associated with time are also infinite. The never-ending URL trap, then, is probably the most common we've encountered. I'm sure you're all familiar with a, a, a standard URL structure such as this. A simple coding error on your internal links can lead to a, a spider crawling and a pretty much never-ending infinite URL such as this. Not ideal for your crawl budget. The session ID trap then is becoming more and more, impor more and more important as a lot of, particularly e-commerce sites, try and leverage first party user tracking. So using FIDs and SIDs instead of traditional third party cookie tracking. You can spot these type of issues using your crawl tools such as Screaming Frog. You can spot them directly within the browser bar and you can see them in the search results directly themselves as well. So again, 
if you have a single link on your entire website that doesn't have inherit the same spider, the same ID as as the, the the one that the crawl visits first, you're open up to it. Every time that the spider crawls your site, you'll have a new ID, so it's an infinite list of IDs that are hitting your website. Again, not ideal for for crawl budget. The facet navigation trap is probably the most difficult to diagnose because mega menus are essentially they're, they're great for UX. They allow users to come into your website, combine selections, filter in any particular order to get exactly what they want on your website. Again, you'll see a standard URL structure such as this, but with faceted navigation, you'll see plenty of additional parameters such as sort by brand, sort by size, color, price, number of products by page, etc. The more options you give a user, the more potential for crawl inefficiencies there is on your website. Take, for example, this small e-commerce inventory. If not managed correctly, so if you multiply all those numbers together, you've got a potential for a billion URLs on your website. So you need to manage it properly on your, on, on your back end. So not, effectively, I've only got three minutes here, so <laughs> I could spend all day doing this. I won't pull a Constantine on you. Um, <laughs> there's loads of different solutions to each of these crawl issues. You need to determine what's important for your business, what do you want to rank for, and what, how to manage your crawl budget accordingly. We have published a 5,500 5 blog post on the topic. Think 10x content. If you want to visit this, find out a bit more, see case examples or solutions to any of these specific spider traps, you can visit it on this bit.ly link. Thanks for your time. Hope you've enjoyed. <laughs> Look, Dan. Okay, hi guys, I'm Daniel. I'm from the SEO team here at Wolfgang. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about how we can use native advertising as part of an SEO strategy. Um, so you've seen this guy already up in the top left corner, that's Andrei Lipitsev, he's one of the top guys at Google. Um, Michaela mentioned when she was talking about content, uh, today I'm going to talk to you about, to you about links. Um, so some of you might think, oh, links are a bit dodgy, but no, we think links still matter. Um, on the right hand side there you can see Andrei's quote, and he's talking about the top ranking factors. And he says, I can tell you what they are, it's content and it's links pointing to your site. On the left hand side there you can see a study that was done by Moz, they asked 150 SEO experts what they felt the most important ranking factors in 2016 would be. Um, the top two bars there on the right are links and the third is content, so there's no question where we need to focus our, our efforts when it comes to an SEO strategy. So why do we use native SEO, why do we use native ads as part of an SEO strategy? First of all, we get a link from a high domain authority website, so we gain the SEO value from that website. Secondly, they're 53% more likely to be clicked on than display ads because they appear more naturally on a homepage and not popping up at you and annoying you. Um, third, we get to reach a wider audience, so we target um, websites that have a huge readership, such as like the Irish Examiner, the Irish Indo, um, so we get some of their, their audience. Um, tied in with that, then we get some brand exposure on a large website, such as, such as a large um, newspaper, and again, we get traffic to our website if people click on that link. So a quick case study then is, um, on the American Holidays, one of our clients. So on the left-hand side there, you can see um, an article we scored on the Irish Examiner website. Um, it was based around Caribbean cruises and the best places to stop on them, so some fun content there. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see the page on American Holidays that we wanted to help rank, um, help this, use this content to help that page rank. Um, and the anchor text there is based around um, cruise keywords as well. So it's nicely optimized and the, the, the article itself has good on-page SEO, which we really wanted to focus on as well. So some quick results then for you. Um, the article itself on the Irish Examiner got 125 Facebook shares, which is not easy to do. You can ask any of the social team here, they'll tell you the exact same thing. Um, then the article also ranked number one on Google News for searches for Caribbean cruises, um, which just goes to show the value of good on-page SEO as well. And that was actually ahead of um, articles that were written more recently as well. So a really good, really good result there. Um, third, um, the American Holidays page that we wanted to, help, wanted to rank jumped from outside the top 50 results into second position uh, for Caribbean cruise searches. So we saw a massive increase in click-through rate onto that page and a massive increase in organic traffic as well. Um, and finally, one thing we noticed just this last week it happened, um, and Kevin's going to touch on this more in the next, next talk, but you can see here that the, the page on American Holidays has actually jumped up to what we like to call position zero. Um, so it's actually hop, hopped over Royal Caribbean from position two into position zero using structured data. Um, so that's a combination of good off-page SEO and good on-page SEO. 
So uh, some really good results there, and hopefully like, it, it's, it's inspired you to use uh, native ads as part of your SEO strategy. Uh, thanks very much. How you doing, everyone? Um, let's get this going. Yeah, my name is Kevin. I'm from the SEO team, and I'm just here to talk to you about structured data. So first things first, uh, just a quick raise of hands for anyone that has heard of the knowledge graph. And keep your hands up if you've heard of structured data. OK, there's a few hands there, not too many. So for those of you that didn't put your hands up, you're not alone. Uh, in a recent study of over 200 million web pages, it was found that 80% of these pages had no structured data applied. So um, it's a, it, this is a very, very forward thinking way of getting your results into SERPs. So I did a recent search there for Game of Thrones. It's a series that I think is excellent. And you can see that the visual end of this, there's three, three elements, and these all come from structured data on websites. So what is structured data? Well, Google it. And the first thing you get is rich snippets. These come from structured data on a website. These guys in Bright Planet were actually down below the first two results and got themselves at position zero. This is accomplished by using structured data. So um, I'm going to go through some just basic, uh, basic examples. You have the knowledge graph. Um, where are we going? Oh, sorry. Sorry, structured data, yeah, it's code that's added to your site. And what it does is it tells the search engines uh, how your information is structured, not just what it says. So now I'm going to move on to the examples. We have the knowledge graph here. This fills up the right-hand rail of the SERPs. And like Brendan was saying earlier on, the ads have moved from this area. Google are now putting these kind of results into the right-hand side. And this builds your uh, authority. The second one is the SERP search bar. With, uh, if you have a search uh, bar on your website, you can, with a little bit of code, you can get this into the search results on Google. And the third example that I'm giving you today is on ratings and reviews. This really makes your results jump out on the page when you've got a lot of results that are just, you know, they're just the normal SERP results. You can get your stars, ratings. It's great for products, it's great for restaurants, and anything that, any pages that have reviews on them. So the main benefits of structured data is it optimizes your visibility. So you can, again, frog hop right up into position zero. These guys are in position three. Now they've got position zero with their, um, with their structured data. And again, what this does, it gives double the above the fold um, position uh, uh, in the Google search results. Secondly, it increases your click-through rate. And again, a recent study where there was um, websites that had uh, structured data applied they were only in position two. There was a 27% lift in clicks in comparison to websites that were in position one with no structured data. So you're, you can see here that click-through rate has increased, and that's exactly what you want. And finally, it enhances your authority. So again, it's just showing you here. It's the search for Savoy Cinema. They're really dominating the whole right-hand side of the search results. And you can even see your show times right up at the very top. Again, a rich snippet. Um, so you can just you can see exactly how uh, structured data can benefit your overall authority in the SERPs. So the future for uh, structured data, Google have already invested very heavily in structured data. Um, they have collaborated with Microsoft, Yahoo, and Yandex um, to do this. Um, they, this is to create the code that will work across all search engines. They've also added structured data, rich cards, and data highlighter to Search Console. This is the main tool for webmasters. And they've also created a special tool that's called a structured data testing tool. And this is a tool that you can put your code in pre-implementation um, pre and test it. And then after you've put it onto your site, you can test it again to make sure that it's all in perfectly and you're going to start enhancing your SERP results. So what does this say? Um, when Google usually invests its time and its money into something like this, and especially when it enhances the SERPs, it's, uh, we would predict that it's going to be a, a ranking factor in the near future. So the key takeaway is, is to not be like the 80% of websites that have no structured data on their site. Get on it, get structured data, optimize your visibility, enhance your authority, and increase your click-through rate. That's great. Thanks very much, guys. Hey guys, I'm back again. <laughs> uh, 
I know that the only reason that you are still here is because you're waiting for, for the answer, right? So <laughs> the results are pretty impressive, okay? I'm warning you at the moment. Let's get started. <laughs> we took one video, 20 second video, and we promote this video in Facebook and, twi uh, sorry, and YouTube, okay? And we put the same budget behind, we were targeting the same audience for the same period of time. And we wanted to track something else than views, because as you know, uh, both of them have a very different way of counting views. So we wanted to track impressions, how many people saw my ad, the overall watch time, so I invest in this money, how, how much of my video content is going out there, and from that, what is the percentage or how many hours are actually quality watch time? So let's t start with impressions. Facebook delivered three times more impressions than YouTube. And what is it, wh why is this happening? It's because the cost per impression is three times cheaper in Facebook. So that explains it. So if you want to put your video in front of as many people as possible, I would recommend you to go there and and try it. And this can help you if you are rebranding or if you are launching a new product, perhaps. The second uh, KPI is overall watch time. And again, Facebook was the winner in this one. Uh, we got more hours out there with uh, this platform. But the thing is that 50% of that time were impressions. So that means that 50% of that time were only not even a view, so counting just from one second to three seconds. And that's why the next uh, metric is pretty important, the quality watch time. Because in this one, uh, YouTube was the winner. So if you are focusing in quality watch time, if you only want to pay for those views that matter to you, I would recommend to go to uh, YouTube. And here's a clear example. While using YouTube, you can see that people tend to watch the full length of your video if it's short. If not, maybe they will watch a little bit more than, than in Facebook. And there you can see also the difference in hours. So which one should you use? Why not using both? <laughs> both of them have very different benefits, okay? So as I mentioned before, YouTube Deliver, it's, well, it's great for quality watch time. You have a five second impression. That means that they can't skip your ad. At least they get the beginning of, of your message there. And if they don't finish the video or if they don't reach the 30 second mark, basically all that video content that you deliver is for free. You are not being charged for that. Whereas Facebook is great for impressions. So you can get as three times more impressions. It's great uh, for a specific targets, as Al and Roshan have mentioned, they, uh, Facebook has a great targeting uh, option. And it's also great for shareable content. We try or we tend to share more in social media. So to illustrate some of these points, I have a video for you. Don't thank me, thank the savings. You can't skip this Geico ad because it's already over. Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Have you seen this ad before? <laughs> so imagine that I skip the ad more or less here. Or, uh, yeah, perfect. So <laughs> how many of us are here right now? About, well, maybe some of you already left, so 250 or 30, 100 um, people. And these views were for free because we skipped that before of the end of the ad. So this is one of the strategies that you can use or one of the tricks that you can use. And if you want more tricks and if you want to know more about this case study, uh, I invite you to go to the Moss blog and see it by yourself. So thank you so much, guys. <laughs> Thank 
Thank you, Kenya. Um, so I'm I have three minutes to talk to you about the authentic advertising revolution. So we're all kind of using social media in a different way t today. We're going to the likes of Snapchat to see celebrities and friends in a more authentic way. A few weeks ago, I actually saw Kim Kardashian take a pregnancy test on Snapchat. That's how real and weird uh, social media is, and it was negative in case anyone was wondering. Um, there's also live video on Facebook, there's Periscope. Again, it's cutting down that editing, that's really just showing real people um, in their real lives. Um, so if any celebrity or anybody at all photoshops a picture and puts it up on social media, the internet will come after you in a major way and you'll be crucified for it. Uh, Khloe Kardashian was slammed for this, as was Beyonce. Um, I'm not going to mention the Kardashians anymore, that's it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so again, people just want authentic um, images and content on social media. So I think this has caused a bit of an advertising U-turn. So I'm going to take Coca-Cola as an example. They've gone from this kind of advertising on social media where it's celebrity endorsed, really high quality, um, to this which is user-generated content. I'm sure you all know the Share a Coke campaign. Um, this is where they just got people to take pictures of their names on Coke bottles. Um, so again, how can a brand become authentic? Well, I think you can become authentic by using user-generated content, and this will boost your authenticity. So I have four case studies I'm just going to really quickly go through, and I hope they'll inspire you to come up with your own UGC campaigns. Um, so the first one is the 53 Degrees North Challenge. So this is where we ask our customers to basically share pictures of themselves uh, doing sporting activities out and about. We got some amazing photos. We even got this guy uh, proposing. Um, so the fact that he took this amazing moment in his life and connected that to a brand is so, it's really amazing to see. And it's really just positive brand reinforcement. Um, for Red Bull, we did Fup Off Rain. So this was uh, to promote their tropical drink. And we asked people to share their kind of typical Irish summer pictures. Again, great, really funny content that we could use. Um, for Tesco Mobile then, we do kind of themed UGC. So we asked people to share various pictures based on a theme each week. So memories or sunset. Again, loads of content. And then just this provides great content for us to reuse and recycle. Um, we've gotten a bit brave with our UGC. So for Tesco Ireland, we've been doing UGC for ages. Um, and this example of an Easter campaign we did where we asked people to, uh, to create crafts with their kids during Easter. Um, so this was really complicated. We put out a, an idea for a craft. We asked people to make it, share their pictures with us. Um, so it was really long-winded. So we were definitely being brave with it. But the amount of entries we got was absolutely amazing. And the quality of the crafts, again, and this is, again, great content for us to reuse. Uh, we've gotten brave again. We're, we're just, we've just launched this campaign for Dublin Airport car parks. And this is the face swap space swap. We're asking people to take a face swap picture um, and for a chance to upgrade their car parking. Um, so again, getting brave. We're getting braver and braver with it. Um, and again, this is really harnessing the new face swap trend. Um, so before you start your own one, I'm sure you're all dying to, to do some UGC campaigns. I've got some tips. Um, so is this picture on their phone already? If you're asking people to submit a picture to you, think about whether they have it on their phone. If they do, they'll definitely submit it to you if there's a prize. Um, is it simple and brand coherent? So is it, does it make sense for your brand to do it? If you think about the Starbucks campaign where they ask people to share pictures of their art on cups, this makes loads of sense for them because everyone takes a picture of their Starbucks cups. So it just makes sense and it's natural for the brand to do that. So just keep that in mind. Um, reuse the authentic images. Again, we noticed when we reuse the authentic images, we got 10 times more engagement. Um, so once you get the, the great UGC content in, keep using it in your ads and you'll see a huge lift in click-through rate and engagement. And last but not least, create a community. So upload the pictures to albums and encourage people to talk to each other um, and, and just create a really nice uh, social community. And most of all, have fun. The whole point of UGC is that you're learning about your customers and you can start a conversation with them. So have fun with it. Thank you. Good luck. Right. Hi everyone, my name is Anna and I'm a social media specialist at Wolfgang Digital and today I'm going to talk about smart targeting and custom audiences on Facebook. So we all know that video is great on social, but can it actually generate uh, leads and paying customers for my business? And the, question, the, the answer to this question is yes, it can. So today I'm going to present my case study for Plan Island and uh, their campaign against child marriage. So as part of a social media strategy, we decided to bring a user on a three-step journey. So firstly, creating awareness around the, the issue of child marriage, then educating users about Plan Island and their campaign against it. And thirdly, uh, generating sponsors and donations for Plan Island. I will explain these three steps later on. 
But what was the core of this um, uh, social media strategy was the fact that we were able to capture the user at every single step of this journey as a custom audience. So whether they were visiting the website, watching the video, or maybe they signed up for a newsletter, we were able to capture them and then remarket to them with le Facebook lead generation ads, so generating sponsors, paying customers for Plan Island. So let's talk about this three-step journey. So first, we presented the user with a powerful video. It was a story of a young girl, she was about seven years old, and she was just about to be uh, married off to like an older or ugly guy. And the video went practically viral. <laughs> he was awful. <laughs> uh, so people went crazy about the video. And as we know from Kenya's talk, uh, Facebook loves video. It's a really cheap way of like putting your brand in front of thousands of people and getting great engagement from, uh, like very co at a very low cost. The second step of the campaign was uh, the website. So all the viewers, of all the users who have already seen the video were encouraged to learn a little bit more about the issue of, of child marriage. Uh, so they were invited to visit the website, educate themselves and uh, join Plan Island in, in their campaign to stop it. And the th third step of this campaign was where we were turning these uh, users who followed the whole journey into paying customers. And we did that with uh, Facebook lead generation ads. Roshin was explaining uh, how this works. So these are like really easy and um, um, easy and quick to use for the user uh, because like the form is pre-populated with user um, personal information like their name, their email address, their phone number. So it's like really efficient. So let's talk about the results. And the results for this campaign were fantastic. So as I mentioned, uh, the video campaign went bonkers. It practically went viral. We generated nearly 200,000 uh, views at just half a cent. Then uh, the, at the second stage of the campaign, we drove a huge volume of traffic to the website. And as a result of that, we have seen an uplift of 90% in terms of online donations. Any leads that we generated from Facebook, uh, they were 75% cheaper than those generated from TV ads. But the most important metric on social is advocacy. So what happened was that uh, our campaign generated thousands of comments, likes and shares, and people were tagging their friends on, on social, on Facebook, and telling them about this uh, really important campaign and uh, encouraging them to join Plan, Plan Island. So my, uh, if there's one takeaway from my presentation is put your brand in front of your target audience, capture them as a custom audience, bring your user on a journey, and then drive results for your business. Thanks. Good luck. How are you? I'm John from the AdWords team, and I'm going to talk to you about how to calculate your in-store conversions. So what I'm talking about here is ROPO, which is research online and purchase offline. So this is when you look at a product or service online, but then decide to go in store to make the purchase. So firstly, I'll just ask uh, how many of us as consumers have done this within the last month? You can just put your hands up. Okay, so quite, quite a lot of us there. We often do it for big ticket items, the likes of jewelry, electrical appliances, and expensive clothing as we like to, to see these in the flesh or try them on before we make the purchase. I should also mention here the user ID view. So if you have a large percentage of customers that use a loyalty card in store and are also logged into your website while browsing, you can use the user ID view through Google Analytics to track both cross-device cross transactions and in-store purchases. However, this is a non-runner for most businesses. The data that I'll be looking at today is already available to you within AdWords and Analytics. So the first report we'll look at is the Distance from Location Extension Report, and this can be found in AdWords under the Dimensions tab. So if your location extension showed with your ad, this report will tell you how far away the user was from that location. In this case, the conversion rate tends to increase with the further away the user is from the store as they're less likely to shop in-store and more, more likely to purchase online. We were really excited about this report and the story that it told, and wanted to try replicate this with anal analytics data. So the report we went to within analytics was the GEO report, 
which can be found under the audience tab. And we took the top 30 locations in terms of sessions and put them into seven different groups based on how far away they were from the physical store. We then calculated their average conversion rate. It resulted in this data. So as you can see, as the user gets further away from the store, their conversion rate increases. So for the 150 kilometer plus group, the conversion rate is 4.07%. And we're going to call this the natural conversion rate, as when people can, can only shop online, this is their conversion rate. The shaded area are robo conversions that began online but resulted with an in-store sale. We're assuming that the conversion rate remains constant in respect of distance from the store. So how do we calculate this? We took the conversion rate from sessions from the 150 kilometer plus group, which was 4.07%. We then subtracted the conversion rate for the groups within 20 kilometers of the store, which was 1.41%. This resulted in an estimated robo conversion rate of 2.66% for users, for people living within 20 kilometers of the store. So just to sum up, every online sale from within 20 kilometers led to another two in store. This is a remarkable figure as it trebles your conversion rate. I should also mention here that over 80% of sessions came from within this 20 kilometer area, and this is likely to be the case for most businesses, as their stores will often be in the cities or large towns. Thanks for listening. Hi everyone, I'm Beth from the AdWords team, and today I'm going to talk to you about the web's most underinvested conversion tactic, which is landing page optimization. So eConsultancy recently re released a report showing that for every $92 spent acquiring customers, just $1 is spent converting them. In other words, companies are investing a lot of time and money in driving high volumes of traffic to their website through AdWords or SEO activities, but investing very little in actually converting this traffic once it's on the website. Sorry. Yep, yeah, it's actually this one now. <laughs> it's changed. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> There's the stat there. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's basically for every $92 spent acquiring customers, just $1 is spent converting them. So companies are investing a lot in driving traffic to the website, but not that much in converting them. You could spend a lot of time in Google Analytics studying data in order to make conversion rate optimization decisions. Today, however, I'm going to show you three really easy ways you can improve your landing page conversion rate. So the first is to improve page relevancy. So iClothing are an online fashion retailer. And back last April, we started to see really high search volume for wedding guest dresses in their AdWords account. But there was no wedding guest section on the website for us to send this traffic to. We decided to test sending this traffic to the main dresses page on the website. And while this campaign saw really high click-through rates, the conversion rate was really low, presumably because the content on the page wasn't particularly relevant to the user's search. We asked Abbas and iClothing to create a wedding guest landing page on the website, which just used existing stock, which was suitable for a wedding. So now, when the user searched for wedding guest dresses on Google and clicked on our lovely Adam position one, they landed on a much more relevant page for their wedding guest search. These simple changes to the landing page help to increase conversion rate by 159%. The next way you can easily improve your conversion rate is to simplify the inquiry process. So stagparty.ie sells stag packages in Ireland, and they were initially seeing really low contact rates, as their information on how to contact was right down the bottom of the page. It was small, and it was really difficult to read. On top of this, the link was a mail to URL, which when clicked on opened up Microsoft Outlook. And Outlook didn't even work on my computer, so you could see how this would contribute to low conversion rates. We asked the client to make some simple changes to their landing page. So now, when a user clicked on a package, there, there was a large Inquire Now button clearly visible at the top of the page. And when the user clicked on this, they were brought to uh, the Contact Us form on the website itself, rather than opening up Microsoft Outlook. These simple changes to the uh, process itself helped to increase conversion rate by a massive 798%. And the final way you can easily improve your conversion rate is to simplify the inquiry form itself. So we run a lead generation campaign for one of our clients who are a solicitor's firm. 
and their inquiry form originally included a large message field on the form, which required the user to think about what they were inquiring about, which just complicated the form and added an unnecessary step for the user. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of the best-selling book, Don't Make Me Think, by Steve Krug, but the, uh, the premise of the book was, is to, sorry, the premise of the book is that a, a website should make the process as easy as possible for the user to complete. We asked the client to simplify the form and they re removed the large message field and included three radio button options instead. Clear making this form easier resulted in 108% conversion rate lift. So just the key takeaways of this talk uh, in order to improve your landing page uh, conversion rate as easily as possible is to identify large portions of relevant traffic and improve landing page relevancy for this traffic, to simplify the inquiry process, and also to simplify the inquiry form. Thank you. That. Great stuff. So I'm aware it's getting quite late, so unless there's any objections, we'll kill the Q&A. OK. <laughs> um, and we'll move, straight to, we'll move straight to the quiz. So just while we're doing this, if the, we're gonna, you're going to have a feedback form handed out now and a biro, so if, we really appreciate if you take some time to fill it in. Um, there, one side of it is the event feedback. For those of you who are clients, if you turn it over, there's a client feedback part. Um, so while that's happening, we'll go straight to the last person standing quiz. So everybody, does everybody have a, a paddle? Everybody does. Does anybody not have one? Okay, if there's one near you that's not been used, please pass it backwards, because there's some people who don't have one. Oh, forget that, don't worry about that one. Has everybody got a paddle now? Yeah, okay. So the way the last person standing quiz works is everybody's gonna stand up, so let's all do that now, please. We're gonna, I'm gonna ask you a question based on the content from today. And the um, question will look like this. What date did Google announce its analytics and AdWords integration for audiences? If you believe it's the red answer, please face the red side to me. And if you believe it's the green answer, face the green side to me. And if I can have some of the, the Wolfgang crew up here as spotters, because people cheat like crazy. <laughs> and just to remind you of the prizes, first place, iPad mini. Second place, we vibe for. <laughs> so, question number one. On what date did Google announce its analytics and AdWords integration for audiences? Red for 23rd of June, green for 25th of June. Let me see your colors now, please. And the answer is, of course, green. So red, sit down, please. Green, stay standing. Um, Next question, you have a 20 second video and you promote it on YouTube. If I watch 18 seconds of your video, would you have to pay for that view? And the answer is green, no. So red, sit down. Did I get that right, Kenya? Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> All right. Um, next question, you can view a Facebook canvas on both desktop and mobile. Uh, red for true, green, for false. Red for true, green for false. And the answer is green, false. Red, sit down. You are green. Though, did you mean to hold up red? <laughs> You're worried about winning the second prize in front of all these people. OK. Uh, what proportion of Irish ad spend goes online? Red, 14. Green, 40. Irish ad spend goes online, and the answer is green, 40. The 14% was Google's global market share. All right, users will see structured data on your website. Red, true, green, false. It's false, of course. Green, so red, sit down. Um, which attribution model uh, credits all channels equally? Red, the proportional model, or green, the linear model? Hold up your colors high, hold them up, hold them up. It is, I made up the proportional model. <laughs> all analytics users can now track cross device, oh, we're down to the last few, cross device. All analytics users can now track cross device transaction via the cross device report. Red for false, green for true. Oh, we're split. We're gonna lose a lot of people here. 
It's false. You need to set up a customer ID view. Okay, oh, right down to the last few. How many paid search results can show on top of the desktop SERP? Red, green, no, no. <laughs> Guess who had Prosecco? Red, three, green, four. Oh, no one's using on that one, okay. Facebook allows advertisers retarget everybody who has seen a multi-product ad. Red for true, green for false. Hold them up high. Oh, people changing minds there. We're going to lose some people here. It's false. They need to click on the ad to go into your audience. Oh, Harvey Norman, you already have plenty of electrical devices. <laughs> Do you have both types? Um, so how many people have we got? One, sorry, one person, two person, three people. Is there a fourth? And fourth up the back. Okay. According to the IAB, ad spend on VOD eclipsed classifieds in 2015. True or false? So red for true, green for false. Have you made a decision? Richard, yeah, and oh, right, we're definitely losing someone. We're going to be dangerous. We're going to have a winner after this one. False. So classifies actually still ahead. So these two gentlemen. So oh, it's a dog fight for the vibrator. <laughs> <laughs> the four Wolfgangers with Moz blogs are Alan, Kenya, Kieran, and red for Brendan, green for Rob. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Google's new custom audiences allow advertisers upload email addresses to analytics and create audiences from there. Red for true, green for false. Lads are both going red. And it's false because it's called, what's it called? Customer match. Yeah, custom audiences is the Facebook one. So you're both still in it. Tiebreaker between the two of you, right? Wolfgang Digital have how many clients? So, Richard, how many clients? Uh, 45. 45, your good self? Uh, 60. 60. And the answer is 78. So we have a winner. So Richard, the We Vibe 4, please come down to the stage and accept your vibrator. <laughs> <laughs> Give him a cheer, folks. There you go. Good man. <laughs> oh, sorry, Richard. Sorry. That's a weird photo, isn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry, what's your name, sir? Jonathan. Sorry, Jonathan. Come on down. iPad mini for Jonathan. Woo! Well done, Jonathan. Thank you. There you go. Excellent. So just before everyone goes, did you all get the, the feedback? You got a chance to do that? Did everybody? Some people? Yeah, OK. Just before everyone goes, just so you could show your appreciation, I'd like to ask all the speakers to come up on the stage. They put a Trojan amount of work into this today. I'd also like to ask Katie, who is the event manager, to come up on the stage as well. Um, and I hope you all, I hope, you know, I hope you, the things we set out to do, I hope you enjoyed it, I hope you're entertained by it, I hope you're informed by it. Um, the, the crew put a lot of work in over the last couple of months, and um, so hopefully it showed and it translated into something useful for you. So, um, once Katie's up here, come on, Katie. <laughs> Could you give everyone a big round of applause, please? Thank you very much. Oh, and Jen, Jen, and, the, and Jen and Daryl did all the slides, and Helena, so you come on up as well. Jen and Daryl and Helena, come on, come on. The slides, the beautiful slides, the videos, the gifts, Jen, Helena, and Daryl. So. And just before we go, there's one man who never stands up for the public speaking and he never does the, the written stuff. He's kind of quietly the foundation upon which everything's built. Uh, his name's Ed. Uh, he was Wolfganger number two. Um, I taught Ed AdWords and he taught everyone else AdWords and we've gone from there. We wouldn't be where we are without him. So he never really gets on the stage because it's not his thing. But please just feel a buzz for Ed as well.
He's gone. <laughs> so, final slide. Why? Oh. Oh. oh, it's gone, is it? We just said bye bye. <laughs> so, hey, there it is. So, we're all going to go for a pint in the bath pub now. If you want to come join, there'll be some food and stuff like that. You're all very welcome. Thanks so much for staying till the end. Bye bye.